I think we're going to start. Hello, start. Yes, please. Okay. Good evening, good afternoon, good day, everyone from wherever you are right now in the world. Um, I want to take this opportunity to welcome you all to this webinar. Um, a special welcome to our Lordship, the Mayor of Freetown, Mayor Yvonne Akisoya. Welcome to this webinar. I want to welcome you all to discuss a proposal for consideration for use of the cable car as a cost-effective transport mode for Freetown. We have international mix of over 150 registered participants for this webinar, including, of course, our own Sierra Leonean colleagues. We hope that your participation will enrich the discussion and provide the necessary information for our policymakers to consider this option as a viable alternative to address a problem of inefficient mass transportation people in Freetown. Now there are a few housekeeping rules that I want to start off with and then I will start by sharing a screen where I can go through the, um, the housekeeping rules for you. It will also be, you will find it also pasted in the chat box for ease of reference. Right. I'm now sharing my housekeeping screen. Can you all see that? Can you see my screen, please? Yes. Yes. OK. So these are the basic housekeeping issues that we want to go through. The first one is to let you all know that this session will last for about 90 minutes. Of course, we are ably assisted at the background by our technical experts, engineer Louis Cheto and Mr. Henry Smith. For this webinar, all participants will be muted. There will be a Q&A session for about 30 minutes or more, depending on how much time we have. And that will be after all presentations. Therefore, participants must use the Q&A window to ask their questions. And I will recommend that you direct your questions to individual members of the panel. Please do not use the chat window to ask questions. The panelists will answer as many questions as possible in real time. If, unfortunately, your question is not answered in real time, you will be contacted by email with your answer. For those who are unable to join this webinar when it is full, they will be directed to join via YouTube, on which it is also available live. For those participants, especially our Sierra Leonean colleagues who will require CPD certificates, please send your request to the email address below so that they will send your CPD certificates to you. For more information or request for access to recording or any other information, please send your request to this particular email. As I just mentioned, this is going to be pasted in the chat window for ease of reference. Now let's, let's get back to business. Um, to start off with, I am engineer Badamasi Savage. I'm your moderator for this webinar. I am a professional civil engineering consultant, with specialty in highways and transportation engineering, and over 40 years of practical and academic experience. I'm privileged to have extensive experience in consulting engineering practice, academia, and also the construction industry. I'm a former head 
of Department of Civil Engineering and also Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and Architecture, Flavi College, where I lectured for over 18 years. I am a past president of the Sierra Leone Institution of Engineers and fellow of that noble institution. I'm also a fellow of the Institution of Civil Engineers of the UK. Now, by the end of this discussion, it is expected that participants will acquire a good understanding of the advantages of the cable car as a viable mass transport mode for Freetown and be able to articulate such understanding with stakeholders and policy makers. For this webinar today, our panelists will comprise of the main presenter, our own engineer, Mudupe Williams, and three other international panelists. Captain Dapo Olumide of Lagos, Mr. Victor Cordoba of Bogota, Colombia, Mr. George Ramos Lopez of Medellin, Colombia also. Without much ado, I will ask engineer Mudupe Williams, who is a project program management professional and chartered civil engineer with over 30 years experience in urban development and in the delivery of major transport infrastructure and organization stroke institution transformation projects. He is the program management consultant on the World Bank funded resilient urban transportation project in Sierra Leone for the city council and provides specialist strategic advice on all aspects of urban planning and mobility to the council. I will now invite engineer Modupe Williams to take over and continue with your presentation. Over to you. Yes, thank you very much, Engineer Savage, for the introduction. And good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good day, everybody on this webinar. Um, I'll now share my screen so you can see my slides. Okay, so the, the, the presentation is based on a paper presented to the European Transport Conference last September, September last month rather, on the feasibility study or the preliminary feasibility study undertaken in-house at Freetown City Council within the Mayor's Delivery Unit on the cable car as a cost-effective transport mode for Freetown. The feasibility study is based on the use of existing data from land use planning and recent transport studies, um, spatial and demographic data, but also for recent authoritative studies undertaken by agencies such as the World Bank. It includes um, an economic and financial analysis of the option of the cable car option and it also has been informed by a review of case studies from low and medium income cities that have implemented the cable car successfully as a mode of mass transit for their city. It has also been um, supported by a major cable car manufacturer as they have provided inputs in identifying suitable corridors potential sites for cable car stations and for installation of the cabling system. So the cable car feasibility study is based on these initial um, analysis provided from the data available both in country and from the support provided by, uh, as I said, a cable car manufacturer. 
So what's the background within Freetown? Freetown is one of the cities that's facing a very rapid urban migration, rural to urban migration. And it has one of the highest population densities in the world. Currently, um, we have approximately 8,500 people per square kilometer, making it one of the most dense, densely populated cities in the world. Um, that's primarily because the surface area of the city is only 84,000 square kilometers. It is quite a very small city with a rapid population growth. In addition to that, the current um, primary mode of transport within the city is of is made up of low occupancy um, vehicles. Mainly, 50% of the of the transport in the city that plies the the roads of the city are the um, the kekes, the three the three wheel vehicles, and the motorcycles, the okadas. They by far make the the majority of the transport in the city, and they cause a lot of pollution by the, by, by nature of the um, the low occupancy and the types of engines that these vehicles have. In addition to that, we have high levels of uncontrolled street reading and very, low, very little parking controls. Um, there is inadequate road infrastructure. The road network is quite um, sparse. There are only about two or three main corridors right through the city. And the, the, the shelf, the, the shelf of the, the flat part of the city is very narrow and it, the, it, it rises quite quickly into, into a mountainous hilly topography. So these, uh, these factors lead to certain challenges. One is congestion and limited, very limited road space capacity. Second point, pollution. Highly built up areas with limited space for new development or all to extend the infrastructure. Many areas of the city are inaccessible by conventional modes of transport. I mentioned the hills. And there's limited funds available to improve transport infrastructure in the city. Coupled with all these factors are the safety hazards. The public transport is overcrowded and unregulated. So in combination, in, this combines both high vehicle emissions low reliability of the existing fleet of public transport. Engineer Modupe, Sorry, can, you, can I inter interrupt you, you there? Can you yeah. please make your screen full, please? OK, sorry, yeah. yeah. Put it on full People are... presentation mode. That's it. OK. Not that one. Sorry, I'm, I think, yeah. Is that all we can get? I think there's, okay, I'll, I'll have to, yeah. yeah. click that, yeah, click that and let's see, presentation mode. Yeah. And then, okay. and then increase the size, let's see, full screen. Can, can you just see full screen now? It's uh, not, it's not, it's not full. I, we can see the full screen, but it's kind of um, very small. Some people might have difficulty reading. Um, okay, are you working with two screens on your computer? I'm working with, yes, I have two screens on. You, you might have to switch the main window to the, to another screen. So the screen we see in full screen is the other screen. So okay, let, let, me, let me take one screen off and use one screen. Yeah. Yeah. It's better. Okay, yeah. okay. Okay. Let's go. Let's go back up now. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Sorry for the interruption. That's fine. That's okay. Yeah. So this slide um, presents um, the issue around um, the rapid population growth 
and it identifies that most of, most of the potential growth taking a 10-year uh, look ahead, but now it's an eight-year look ahead, is likely to happen in the hilly areas of the city. Um, it's based on the last population statistics of the um, census of the city, and it um, indicates where um, the growth in the city is like to like it to happen. What, what I want to do is to show you a different um, version of this particular slide, so we can look at the the areas a bit more closely. Can you see my screen still? Yes, you can. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna widen the screen slightly. The, the blue circles represent the areas, the wards in the city. So, so, sorry, can you make it larger? Because make people, it larger again. people are saying they can't, um, it's too small on this. Some okay. people access on small devices. Go back to the size that you use earlier. Yeah, so the, the, I'm just, that you the, are using. Just an illustration, the blue, the, the slide here shows the population a wall. So this is the edge of the, um, of the city of Freetown, the, the most westerly ward, and the size of the circle indicates how dense that, that ward, densely populated the ward is. That's to the east, that's to the west. Moving down to the east, we begin to see a much uh, more densely populated city with much larger circles. Some wards having populations in, ex in excess of 64,000 people per ward. Um, the average um, and the, the, the pink circles indicates the density per hectare. So you have over a thousand people on average per hectare living within the, the city of Freetown. And a hectare is, is sort of about 2.5 acres. So this is help, helping to illustrate first how densely, densely populated the city is but also it's helping us to, to realize that the growth of the city is happening on the hillsides. As you can see the contour lines, and you can see that um, as you move further east, the circles are getting much, much bigger. And these are all in the main new communities that never, never existed 20 years ago. So the city is spreading into the mountains and it's spreading rapidly into, uh, and highly densely into towards the east, into highly densely populated communities. So going back to the slides, yeah. What are the key urban challenges for Freetown? We've talked about the rapid increase in public transport demand. The, the estimates from a recent study taken two years ago shows that the average demand along the Eastern Corridor will rise to about 14,000 passenger movements in the peak hour. The current levels are, are about six to 8,000 in the peak hour. So they're, 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 just, they're set to over double in, in the next um, 10 years. In, in accessible and hard to reach hillside communities have a limited access to basic public services. And that's a problem, as I just demonstrated, that these areas are densely populated and there is no transport into many of these communities. And many of them even lack basic roads to access these communities. There's significant, significant congestion along um, Freetown's main east-west corridor. There are only two main corridors in the city, and those are highly congested, particularly in the east side of the, free, of the city. Increasingly, uh, the issue of carbon emissions is becoming um, a concern for Freetown, and there, there are parts of the city where there's been some um, evidence of carbon emissions exceeding the um, allowable limits, considering the, the low vehicle, compatible low vehicle ownership in the city, it is quite concerning that we are already beginning to exceed our, carb our carbon emissions from um, from, 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 from um, motorized traffic. Social isolation in specific areas and community separation is also a concern. And, and also that the issue around unregulated and unintegrated modes of public transport. 
we are public transport operators are not regulated and many of the low occupancy um, operators um, see the transport as industry as a means of, ha of having a, a livelihood, but the cost of congestion, the cost of, um, of the increase in, 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 in road safety is not, is not factored in because these um, modes are not regulated. So there's no um, means of, um, of ensuring that the public uh, are, are protected. And finally, the, the final point also, the CBD, the Central Business District, as a result of the congestion in or into, the, into the central, into the city, where it's experiencing a slow decline. There are many um, buildings and offices in the Central Business District that are currently unoccupied or in a poor state of repair, all as a result of um, the poor traffic um, situation in the city. Um, these are photographs I took recently that just illustrate the typical tra transport um, modes into free in Freetown. The first is a is a minibus. Uh, we call them a puda pudas in in Freetown. They carry about eight to ten passengers, but very, more often they, more often than not they carry a lot more people than that, and that's that's that makes up about. Um, 44% um, of, the, of the traffic. Um, the, the motorbikes, they carry one or two passengers per, per motorbike. And then the three wheelers um, also carry about three people per, per vehicle. Um, the 80% 80, 80 of, of the traffic in the city is made up of um, public transport of this kind, of which the breakdown is shown in the, in the chart below, in the, um, in, in the, in the table below. So um, minibuses is 44%, but the proper large size buses only make up about 4% of the um, total traffic in the city. So we see a high, a, a disproportionate, disproportionate number of low occupancy vehicles, over 50% of the, of, the, of the public transport is low occupancy vehicles in the city. Um, I took this photograph um, along Kissy Road on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a way to a meeting or to a site visit. I left my, I left my, um, my home at Wilkinson Road at about half past seven, and I got to um, the meeting at 10 o'clock. It took me two and a half hours to get through um, um, the east side of the city. And you can see that the, the traffic is uncontrolled. You can see the, the motorbikes are everywhere, They're weaving between the cars. And this is unsustainable. So from a policy perspective, what, what are the policy, policy indicators that we are trying to address in proposing improvements in the trans, along the transport corridor? The medium term development plan identifies a number of policy clusters. And in cluster two, it looks at diversifying the economy and promoting growth. And one of the means of promoting growth is by improvement in transport, creating better access accessibility to high quality jobs. So that's one of the, um, the national policy drivers that we are trying to address through the um, proposals we are exploring here. Within the Transform Freetown, there's also a, a, a target to reduce congestion in the city by about 50% in five key locations, as illustrated there before in the, in the, in the, on the slide, at Congo Cross, Eastern Police, Lumley, Juba, Wilberforce, Otobango, and Wellington um, PMB Junction. In addition to these two points, Freetown is also a member of the group of C40 cities that are committed to taking action to tackling the causes of climate change through reduction in carbon emissions. So all of these three um, policy drivers are informing our, 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 our options when we can look at solutions to addressing the transport problems in Freetown. So why the cable car? 
this slide tries to illustrate some of the uh, basic principles on the mode of operation of the cable car. The cable car is very old technology. It's been around for over 100 years. But more recently, it's been used as a means of urban transport within cities. The cabins are, are hauled on a above ground um, and they travel at a speed of approximately um, 15 to 20 miles per hour or 25 to 30 um, kilometers per hour. So they're, they move relatively comparatively slowly, but they're not in, impeded by any other means of, um, of transport. They, they, go, they go one way on a straight line and change direction at the terminal station. So the cable, passengers get in and out of the cable car at stations. And, and typically, a cable car line would have about three to four stations along the route. And the boarding of the car is at a level with a platform fully accessible for passengers with mobility, mobility impairment. So um, you will normally um, board a cable car station about two to three stories above ground level, and you will enter the car and, and, the, and you will move to the next station um, by being um, hauled in the air along the cable route. They're most often used in mountainous regions or territories where roads are difficult to build or to access. And they are um, powered by electric power motor. They have a single motor that powers the, the whole system. They are, as I said, the technology is relatively fundamental in terms of its um, complexity and its proven technology. It's, there's nothing typically um, innovative about the cable car technology. In terms of passenger carrying capacity, this slide illustrates it's the ability of a cable car to move um, large numbers of people when compared to other modes. For example, the cable car takes, can take up to 6,000 people per hour, and that will, will require 120 buses to carry that same number of people, and 200 putapodas, and 2,000 kekes. So in terms of um, efficiency in carrying and moving people, the cable car can be considered to be a, a very um, effective um, people carrier. It carries people quite, um, large numbers of people quite, quite quickly through the, um, the, the, the corridor, un unimpeded by other forms of transport. So what other modes are available to Freetown that we can consider as effective and cost-efficient solutions? Um, the most common, and which we, the city has tried several times, is looking at the bus fleet. And many cities, especially in developed countries or developing countries, consider the solution to have a rapid bus transit. And a rapid bus transit solution is probably an effective solution, but your, your best infrastructure needs to be such that you can provide for bus lanes, you can provide for bus stops within your existing um, highway um, boundaries. That's not the case for most of the corridor within the east-west corridor I referred to earlier on. The Western Corridor has a lot more capacity, but the Eastern Corridor is significantly constrained. There are proposals for hillside bypass. Well, it is in construction, it's more than a proposal. It is in construction, but it is a bypass. It's, all of its features is such that it bypasses all the, um, all the growth centers within the, within the city, and it's it's, it's more a rapid, route, a rapid route out of the city to join the Baibura Road to take you into the hinterland of the country. It is a bypass and not necessarily a, a distributor road within the city. So, so likely you would want to, to route your rapid bus transit on the hillside bypass. 
light rail is a, is a potential solution, but right, light rail systems would normally require uh, a higher population size, and also they would require a lot more um, space on, on, on route for, um, for aligning your, rail, your, your railway systems. And free time, as I said, is very constrained in terms of space, very built up city, the level of land take would be, would be quite substan substantial. And that's, that's, and that's the same for tramways. The other solutions like building or, or extending your existing road network would have a similar um, impact to either the, the light rail system or the tram system. You will need to compulsively purchase large amounts of property and the whole process can take several years as one has observed with the hillside bypass, which is currently still in construction for the last 10 years. So in taking that principle a little bit further, we looked at a, a number of key features that you would want to use in assessing a transport, uh, a transport mode against core technical, financial, and commercial considerations. So we looked at this four as, as ways of evaluating this, that transport mode against, against the cable car. So the transport requirements is broken down into um, the passenger carrying capacity. And by this, I mean, um, how appropriate is that mode for the current demand for Freetown? Is it too little or is it too much? I mentioned that the, um, the light rail system would require a higher demand than the current forecast demand for free time. A light rail system would need to be carrying about 20 to five to 30,000 people an hour. So we don't have that current demand in free time. So that might not necessarily be an appropriate solution. Does that, is that mode does that mode of travel follow the demand desire line? Does that, is that mode of travel link people between their origins and their destinations, where they need to travel from and need to travel to? If, if that mode does not get people close to where they need to be at, it does not provide a complete solution and it will need to be complemented by other modes. The other transport requirement is predictable journey time. How predictable is the journey time based on other, other interfacing um, or, inter or interacting um, uh, factors that can either impede, that can impede the, the, the journey time of that um, mode of travel? And this is typically with regard to, um, to, to bus systems. Bus systems can work well if you can build the bus lanes, if you can improve the junctions, if you can provide um, the, the spaces for, for loading and unloading at, at bus stops. Will the transport system complement current proposals for improvement in the coastal bus corridor? Uh, as I mentioned, under the, another project that proposals to improve the coastal bus corridor by the coastal bus corridor, I mean the corridor that comes from the peninsula to the west, in, along Wilkinson Road, through Congo Cross, and into the central district, business district, and then back out to the east, either through Furabe Road or Kisi Road, into the Baibure Road. That is the coastal corridor I'm referring to. Will, that, will the solution complement any pro future pr proposals to improve the coastal bus corridor. So we assess all of these, these three core, these four core modes, four core modes against this, this criteria. And then the final point about on transport requirements was, does the mass transit solution cost, cost effectively satisfy the current and forecast demand? Does this solution meet the current demand and will it be able to cope with the future demand that's forecast based on estimates in 
in in um, in land in land use activity along potential routes. So um, we, we we did a similar assessment looking at the environmental impact of the mode and the technical and construction considerations. How easy it is for that solution to be delivered with, with within the constraints of um, of the space you require to, to construct the infrastructure to support that mode and within the constraints of um, um, allowing you the opportunity to penetrate into the hillside communities, how efficient will that mode be if you, if, if you had to take um, the, the carrier into the hills? And then finally, the costs, the cost of the scheme and the financing requirements um, of that scheme. How, 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 how well does that, does that solution lend itself to, um, to various financing uh, options that are available for, for, for transport modes? So this was done for four main transport um, potential solutions for Freetown. The first was the bus rapid transit, which I talked about just now. The other was the um, overground light rail or the tramway. Oh, and then the third is waterborne transport solutions. That's where you assume that you can bring people from um, a jetty somewhere in the west and bring them to the east again on the coast as a potential um, express service to bring people into the city more rapidly. And then the third solution, the fourth solution was the, the gondola cable car. I mean, the, we tried to kind of um, use the green, amber, red uh, indicators to, to green indicating satisfactory, um, that that would be satisfactory for that um, requirement and red, red in, implying that that mode is significantly constrained to meet that particular requirement. And for all of those, for core um, requirements, the transport requirements, the environmental requirements, te 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 technical and construction considerations, and cost and financing requirements, the cable car seemed, in our view, to, um, to be satisfactory for Freetown. All the other three modes seem to have significant constraints, specifically around following the travel demand desire line, um, complementing current proposals for improvements in the bus corridor, and, and the, um, the mass transit solution satisfying um, current and forecast demand. And the other area in which the other modes seem to be very, limit, li very limiting in was the ability to um, to, to, um, to allow penetration into the hillside communities. You can't take a boat into the mountains. It, it needs to be something that can actually get into the hills. And we have also kind of illustrated that the growth of the population is mainly in the hillsides to the east of the city. So cable cars, are becoming a popular transport mode in other major cities, particularly in the global south. Uh, if you can see the slide more clearly, it shows that those cities that have built cable cars, of which we have a, a few of the representatives of those cities on our panel here today, and cities like um, Lagos, Accra, Kampala, and um, Kilimanjaro in Tanzania are also considering the cable car as a means of transport to address some of their, 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 their transport needs within their cities. So we'll get to hear why other cities have chosen this mode for, to address the transport, the transport requirements. I want to talk very briefly about the La Paz case study because that, that really did, that caught our attention for a number of reasons. Um, but the La Paz, first constructed its first cable car line in 2011 to connect the city of La Paz with a, with a higher located El Alto region, which has 1.7 citizens. 
and to reduce traffic congestion and close the geographic and economic gap between the poor and the middle classes. So it, it was seen as a, as a way of addressing um, social and economic um, disparities and inequities within the city. And the cable car was to provide transport from the hillside communities, which were cut off, and bringing them access to where they had more, 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 more likelihood to more, more chances of finding, of finding jobs. The project costs in phase one was about 235 million for three lines, and phase two was 506 million. Um, the, the cost of the, um, the fare is, is about three Bolivianos, Bolivianos, which is equivalent to about 3,300 leons, or probably about equivalent, equivalent of 30 US cents. So, and that compares quite favorably to the, the figure we have put into our, in, into our business case in the free time cable car. We are estimating that we're likely to charge some, that somewhere in the order of about 4,000 Sierra Leone Leones um, for a trip. The system is equipped with solar panels to power the doors and the lights and the Wi-Fi system. So there is some element of sustainability even built into the cars. It transports about 6,000 passengers per hour. And the first line took only two years to build and provided 1,200 full-time work jobs for, for workers in the city. Uh, and the cable car leaves the station every 12 seconds. These are key features of the scheme to illustrate what's possible. And the, the, the core feature of the La Paz scheme compared to many other, other cities, the cable car forms the backbone of the city's transport, public transport um, mass trans transit network, mass transit network. It does not have a light rail system. The cable car is the main transit mode. And um, the system, uh, as for this case study we, we looked at, um, does not require a grant subsidy. And it's, it's reported an operating surplus of of six, 5.8 US dollars demonstrating financial um, sustainability of this social inclusive business model. So that's what yeah, one of the- Williams, can you just try to round up please? You need okay. to leave for questions and answers. Please. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll move ahead and not talk about the other case studies. The others will cover those. Um, yeah, the free time proposal. The Freetown proposal is based on um, three lines. There's a West line, and there's a Mount Ore line, and then there's the East line. We have selected the East line as the potential trial, trial line. And that will start in the, in the CBD. We've got two potential sites in the CBD for the, first, for the um, terminal station. And uh, there'll be a stop on the, at Eastern Police Station and a second stop, a third stop at Mountain Court, and the terminus for the pilot route will finish off at um, Kissy Ferry Junction. But there, there is a phase two to the pilot line, which will extend the pilot line into Wellington. Um, this line meets the hillside communities at Mountain Court off the um, hillside bypass. The second line starts at um, the Western line, will start at um, Lomley, um, going to Botamanga, Rubberforce, the National Stadium in Brookfields, and then coming to the CBD at one of the two potential um, stations we have identified. And the third line is a connection line between the East and the Mantoria line, starts at the National Stadium, goes into Duazak, um, comes into Leicester tree planting community through Flabe College and links back into Mountain Cut. So these are the three primary routes we are looking at as an integrated route for Freetown. We've, 
we're also planning to um, provide interchanges with the protect with the new um, proposals for a bus coastal bus corridor at Lomley bus at, at Lomley at Kisi Ferry Junction and at the Eastern the Eastern Police Station. So these three these three lines will have uh, interchanges with the coastal bus route, allowing allowing um, um, passengers to to, to join the um, the cable car at any of these locations from the from the bus service. Okay. Yeah. So these are the um, aerial photographs, the aerial plans of the cable routes provided by um, the the cable car manufacturer, and these plans show the footprint of the stations that we will need to safeguard in order to um, take the proposals further. So the, we've identified sites for stations. They're not definitive signs at sites as yet, but a, typically a station occupies about uh, a half an acre of land. So not a half an acre, about, uh, yeah, a quarter of an acre of land. And um, they're about 20 meters wide about six meters long. And um, this is the typical cable car route, cable car station, and we have footprints of the stations. We also need to safeguard the, the height of the, of the cable lines. So when we do decide on the final location of the stations, we will need to um, safeguard the, 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 the cable car routes so that tall buildings are not built along the proposed line for the cable car. Um, a typical cable car station, a terminal station, is shown in this diagram below. This is the terminal station to the, in the CBD. This is what we look like. You, the, you have the boarding section and you have the, the, the cabin parking. All the cabins end up at the terminal station and are kept there overnight and they leave the terminal station and join onto the cables and are moved through the pulley system, the, um, the pulley system throughout the day. And they're regulated based on the, 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 tra the, travel, the travel demand at different times of the day. So you have more cars in the morning and evening peaks traveling through the um, network and maybe fewer cars at other times during the day. Um, this is Two minutes more, please. Sorry? Two minutes more to round Okay, yeah. This is a summary of our, of our business case for the, for the pilot route. We estimate the pilot route to be about 3.6 kilometers long. Um, it has a capacity of um, 6,000 passengers per hour. And um, the ticket price is for, is for about 4,000 leons per person. And the, the, the cable car will operate for about 12 hours. Estimated capital cost, $36 million. The cost of feasibility of the study and the initial design, about 2 million. The cable car operating costs is about 30% of the annual revenues. Uh, we estimate utilization at 70%. From these figures, we have a benefit cost ratio of about two, with a payback period of about 12 years. Um, the options for financing the cable car, we, we are looking at a combination of all three options, including grant funding, um, public-private partnership, mainly looking through at a, as a build-own build build transfer agreement, with a, with a mix of debt and equity. And we are also looking at ways by which the city can capture some of the added value that um, landowners will, will get from the improvement provided by the infrastructure through the tax um, revenue system. So we're, we're taking all these three factors in, into account in looking at the financing short-term financing and long-term income stream that the cable car will provide for the city. I think I will finish my presentation on this slide. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, um, Modupe. Um, that took um, uh, quite some time, and um, uh, I will crave the indulgence of um, participants um, because we we needed to present the case properly, and um, uh, we hope that um, uh, we will manage to get some more time for um, the Q and A. And um, also to let you all know that um, uh, these presentations will be made available, you know, to people who like to get them. You know, we'll send these presentations to your to your emails for um, better understanding. At this point in time, we're going to try to save some time. I'm going to now ask Captain Dapo Olumide, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Ropeways Transport Limited of Lagos, Nigeria, which is a concession company responsible for implementing the Lagos Cable Car Project. Um, most of us know, or we have read, about the massive urban congestion in Lagos City, similar to Freetown. Captain Olumide will share his experience with us about how he was able to successfully negotiate a 30 year franchise agreement with the government of Lagos State for the operation of three cable car routes for Lagos. Over to you, Captain Olumide. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you can all see my screen, first of all. Can you see the screen? Yes. Yes. So okay, good. great. Right, before I start, well, let me just uh, say it's a pleasure to have Mayor Yvonne Akisoya on this uh, webinar and our colleagues from South America. It's a real pleasure. Uh, but before I start, I'd also like to say that this concept is not new to me. Back in 2011, I was in uh, Freetown with, a, I was an advisor with a group of bankers from a DFI. Uh, to make proposals for different sectors of the economy in uh, Sierra Leone. And my pitch was the cable car in Freetown. So here we are between 2011 and now, it's hopefully coming to life. So this is excellent news for me. Uh, but let me talk about the Lagos cable car system. And it's very important for me to emphasize the fact that this is a private project. Uh, most of the cable car systems in a city are run and owned by the government, but this is a private venture with no involvement from the government. It sounds confusing, but I'll talk you through it and I'll tell you the advantages of having done it that way in a place like Lagos. Um, let's try and get the slides to change. Okay, uh, these are the table of contents, but what I'm going to do is go through it rather rapidly because of uh, for the sake of time, okay? We actually have a 50 year franchise agreement with the state of Lagos. And the reason it's called a franchise agreement is because um, there is another cable car in Nigeria in the Eastern portion of the country in the mountains, uh, but that's a tourist cable car. So uh, the government decided to give us a franchise, you know, based on the fact that it's a similar type of thing, although that's purely tourist. The cable car in Lagos, when it's operational, will be called the Lagos Skybus, and it uh, covers a distance of about 11 kilometers. There are three lines. I won't bore you in too much detail, but we have about 218 cabins in the air at any given time, and we'll be transporting about 112 million people a year. Uh, it was interesting to listen to Engineer Williams scare us with a population density in Freetown of 8,400 persons per square kilometer. Well, I'm going to scare you now because Lagos on a good day is 20,000 people per square kilometer. But in fact, it's 17 trips a day in Lagos. 17 million trips a day in Lagos. Okay, let's try to get this thing to change. Now, you can see the pictures on the left here shows you typical street scenario in Lagos. And the top picture on your left, it's not actually a parking lot. It's not a car park. That's just the traffic. And those are the 
the minibuses that uh, move up and down the city every day. It looks like a car park for the uninitiated, but it's not. Um, again, like I said, I'm going through this presentation faster than I would have for the sake of time. But the reason behind the project was because it complements the existing transport infrastructure that exists in Lagos. It also uh, creates jobs, and that's a significant thing. We have to focus on that in Africa. It creates jobs. It's a, it's a clean, uh, environmentally friendly uh, type of project. For example, we already have certification from the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Control. We already have a certificate valid to the year 2043. And of course, it alleviates a lot of the congestion in the city. I would like to add one thing which engineer Williams didn't mention, and that is that there are six types of urban cable car designs or systems available for use. There are many more, but those relate to the tourist centers, uh, the mountains, ski resorts, and so on. But for a city, you have six types, and these are the pictures you have here. And it ranges in capacity from eight all the way up to 200 in each cabin, as you can see from the Funi 4. But again, I'm not going to go into technical details here, but you have a wide array of uh, different systems that you can deploy based on the frequency and the number of people you want to use. For example, this is one in um, Algiers, and this is another one in uh, Algeria, okay? Uh, Engineer Williams touched on the various places where you do have urban cable cars, and this just gives you another overview of that. And in terms of the potential demand, it's incredible. Um, we, we carried out a study uh, and we interviewed 100,000 residents in Lagos, and the demand was just off the scale. In other words, if we don't have a cable car, transport in Lagos would come to a halt. And there are significant journey time savings, you can see on the right there, uh, in blue going by cable car and if you go in a bus. In some locations within Lagos, because of the sheer volume of traffic, it can save you up to two hours by going through uh, via cable car. The structure, the, the, the financing structure of this project, because it's private, it involves guarantees from the government, from the federal government and from the state government in terms of a passenger revenue shortfall, not a project guarantee, because you see in the private sector, you have what they call APGs, advanced payment guarantees. So it's quite clear how the contractor, his obligations are in terms of delivery, lump sum turnkey projects. He's got to deliver this project at 2 p.m. on September the 22nd. But when you're dealing with the, uh, the government, you don't need them to give you a project guarantee. You only need a revenue shortfall guarantee during the ramp up period. While the, the initial depends on you actually, the, from the first six months to the first three years, uh, as the number of passengers builds up and it guarantees the lenders their revenue streams. So we do have that in place. There are certain risks and how to mitigate them. For example, the commercial revenue risk uh, like I said, we do have a, a revenue shortfall guarantee from the government of Nigeria, and that provides the funding to the uh, lenders if we don't have sufficient funds to make up the uh, revenue. Um, we also have the change of law risk built into the agreement. So if there is a change of law, the government will reimburse us all the construction costs and the lenders, total amount of money that the lenders put in place. Again, foreign exchange risk is also a problem. Um, but of course, we're trying to pay all our contractors locally in Nigerian currency to minimize as much as possible the foreign exchange risk. There is an environmental risk, but this project has a full ESIA category two. Uh, from the construction point of view. There is an operating risk. And again, to mitigate that, we have, um, we have various aspects to it. One of which is an operations and maintenance. Let me just stop here because I've got a lot of questions coming in here, um, but I'll come back to those in a minute. Oh, sorry, I don't know what's happened here. 
Uh, yeah. Let me stop this and come back. I Is don't that know what the end of there. your slideshow? No, it's not. It just stopped, I guess. Must just start it, off, start it again, don't worry. Yeah. Okay. That's, I don't know what's happened to it now, but. Uh, just give me a minute here. I don't know what's happened to it. No, I think it's, it's the internet. Um, no, it's, it's, I don't know, can you see it now? Yes, we can. We can, we okay. can. All right. Okay, let's continue where I left off. Um, there's, there's a patronage risk in terms of you're not sure how many people are going to use a system. And so you have to make sure that you've done enough studies about that. And that covers the entire system completely. But you see, what I wanted to avoid doing in this presentation is to make it too long. I have a different presentation. That's why there was a difficulty with this one. But I can see because of time, I've had to send you an abridged one. But I have the ability to answer all the questions that you would have, because I want to give the other uh, gentlemen time to make their presentations as well for the sake of time. So I'm going to end my presentation here and leave the rest for a Q&A. Thank you very much, Captain Olumide, for that um, uh, insightful um, presentation. I think um, uh, a lot of the questions really that I had, you know, have been answered, particularly with respect to the um, um, uh, financing um, structure. Thank you very much. Right. At this point in time, I'm going to call on Mr. Victor Cordoba, who is a civil engineer of Bogota, Colombia, with a specialization degree in business administration and a master's in corporate finance. He has over 15 years transport projects experience in countries like Colombia, Panama, Peru, Chile, South Africa, UAE, Bangladesh, amongst others. He is the CEO of Consortio Cable Mobile, which is a consortium which is the operator with a contract for the operation of Transmi Cable, the first urban cable car system in Bogota, Colombia. He will share with us some of the transformational benefits of a recently opened cable car line for a fast urbanizing city of Bogota and the challenges in planning that particular project. So I now call on Mr. Cordoba to make his presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Nasi, and thank you everybody for, for the opportunity to, to tell uh, the story about Transmicable. Um, uh, first, the advantage, I think, I think Mulpe has spoken a lot about the advantage of, of, of you run cable cars, so I'm not going to stop uh, in, this, in this slide. Uh, but one of the main advantages we see here, uh, and according to our experience, is the fast execution uh, once you have the, the project. In our case, and it could be a little bit faster, but in our case, the construction was awarded in 2015 by the end of the, of the year, and the operation started in 2018. So it was compared to other type of transportation like, like buses, like BRTs, things like that. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very fast project to be executed. Um, uh, in 2000, we were awarded in 2018 with a contract for the operation uh, to, to our company, which is Consortium Cable Mobile, which is first 50% owned by Fanalca, which is an industrial group in Colombia, and 50% owned by Transdev, which is a company from, from, 
Air France, which is one of the main transport, public transport operators uh, in the world. Uh, our system, just a, a little brief of our, our system, is composed of 163 cabins, 24 pylons, four stations, a total uh, trip, time, trip length is 3.3 kilometers. We have a, an install capacity of 3,600 passengers per hour per direction using our 10 passengers, seating passengers per cabin. Uh, last year, uh, we we're moving an average of 30,000 passengers uh, per working day. Uh, that was in the pre-COVID uh, situation. The interesting, more than the, the 30,000 uh, number, the interesting thing here was that the expected mobilization was 18,000 uh, passengers uh, per day. So basically, from the start, the, the, the mobilization was a lot higher than, than, than expected. And the other important thing here is that the, the, the total trip time that previously using buses took one hour or maybe more in case of, of heavy congestion. Now it takes only 13, one, three minutes to, to be done. Uh, it's, a, it's a fully environmentally uh, friendly solution, fully uh, electric with solar panels in all the cabins. And with a, we operate with a reliability here of 99.9%. Um, basically the difference is because you, sometimes you have to stop because you have a wind, you have a, maybe electrical storm, things like that. But basically it's, a, it's, it's fully available the whole time. All the system is equipped with cameras inside the cabins plus 95 cameras in the stations and 30 cameras in the pylons. So it's, it's a very well secure and monitored area. So it's people, this is very important in, in an area like Seattle Bolivar, which is the, like the neighborhood in which we operate. Uh, so for people to, fe to feel safe inside the, in, inside the cabins. It's a system that operates the whole day, basically the whole day from we start every day at 4.30 in the morning and finish our operation at 10 p.m. Except holidays, which is one, one hour less at morning at, at night. This is also a challenge because um, when you go to Europe, they operate in winter, uh, maintain at night, maintain during the, uh, during the, during the summer, uh, and that's it. But these, these kind of systems, you, you need to have a very strong technical reliable team because basically you have a few hours during the night, at midnight to, to do all the maintenance, but it's something that can be a full achievable. I mean, it has, it has, has been proved already. In the particular context of Bogota, one of the key elements of, of, of the cable is that it's not an isolated project, but it's a project that is part of the integrated system of the of the of Bogota and also is directly connected to the BRT station in which you can take uh, once uh, you can take these articulated and be articulated buses to, to to move faster around town with a single with a single ticket. So once you pay uh, in the cable, for example, you need to pay uh, mm -hmm. for the use of the articulated buses in the BRT. Uh, this is like a picture of the connection. Basically, this is a, this is a parking and the maintenance area. Uh, this, the, the cabins arrive here. Then people, the people just take this tunnel and arrive to the BRT station, take the articulated buses, and go straight to the CBD. Uh, one, one of the very important uh, 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 factors, on, one of the most important factors in the success of, of, of this project was that it, 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 it isn't just a transportation project. It's a, it's, a, but it's a project that is renewing the whole area. This is a picture of how it was the area before, uh, how we had ended. So it's just not the station, but it's also a, 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 a ur urban renewal around. And, it's, and the station also includes infrastructure for the, for, the, for the area. I mean, it includes supermarkets, it includes auditorium for the use of the community, it includes uh, a, a center we call it Supercade, which is a, a, a like a satellite office of this of the 
of the city in which you can do all the activities uh, that previously need to be done in the CBD of, of the city. Now it can be done here. So it's not just a, a, a Transmicable is not just a project that lets you go to the CBD, but also a project that is attracting people uh, to make activities here. And what also what we are seeing here is that previous before Transmicable, the people living in South Bolivar uh, wanted to go to live in other parts of town. Now many people is going back to Ciudad Bolivar to live around this area and, and a lot of uh, value, land value is being captured uh, after that for the benefit of the city. Also, the Transmicable is not just a transportation project, but it's the, the renewal of the whole area. But is, it included all the supercar that I already, told, I already told you about, a central area, which is the, for the elder, uh, public spaces, sports, uh, parks, uh, it's a whole a whole concept uh, of, of development for, for the community. Uh, the way it works here is like this: um, an entity called the Instituto Instituto de Desarrollo Urbano (IDU), which is the uh, the entity from the mayor uh, that builds all the infra transport infrastructure in, in Bogota, built the 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 cable. Once 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 it's built, it's, it is transferred to Transmilenio, the that controls all the transport system of the city, and Transmilenio opens at, um, a tender to hire uh, the operator, which, as I told you, is a, is, is a consortium within, within Fanalca and Trattep from France. Uh, in the case of the construction, this is a Doppelmayr uh, system. Uh, the cost of the construction here was seven. 76 million euros. Uh, it is worth mentioning here that it includes uh, all the land. And that and, and also it's important to mention here that infrastructure is beyond just the uh, just the transportation needs because it also includes uh, a, a lot of uh, additional um, urban uh, stuff for, for, the, for the community. Because it's, as I told you, it's more than transportation. It's a, it's a, it's an, a development, a total development of the community. Uh, the contract for the operation is not just the electromechanical component. We do, obviously we do that, but we do the system operation. We do all the electromechanical maintenance of the system. We do all the maintenance of the infrastructure because what, also what we try to do and what the city tries to do is to keep the 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 state of the infrastructure always in perfect condition to guarantee the quality of life and the quality of the trip for every for every passenger that uses our system. It includes also the, the stations and passenger security. We have 90 security guards, for example, all the evasion control, all the internal and external cleaning system. We clean the stations the whole day to keep it every, everything tidy. And one thing that is absolutely important at least in our case, which is the social management, we do all the all the uh, all the we manage all the relationships with the community around, which has proven to be a, a, a very key element. But because, in, in when for for example, when we had here protest and the and, and the and the city maybe turns into a chaos, things like that, like like the one we saw in, in the U.S. Or, uh, a few months ago, everybody was. The, the city maybe was a chaos, but everybody was protecting the cable. So that proves the importance of the social management. Um, key elements of the structure, basically our remuneration is for, a, for availability of the system and to guarantee the speed of the system. If the system gives the passengers a promise of moving at, at 5.5 meters per kilometer, meters per second, we have to guarantee that. We have to have a contract based on, on, on a very detailed, detailed service level. I mean, it goes to the, to if there's water in the floor, we have 50 minutes to clean it. And if we don't, we have to start uh, paying penalties until we do it. So obviously we, uh, we don't want that. Um, all the co uh, control and monitoring of, of doing in, in the, uh, personalized for, for, for the passengers, all the evasion control and the integration of tariffs to use the, the rest of the transportation system in Bogota. 
some figures of the of our operations. So, as I mentioned, 163 cabins. It takes now only 30 minutes to the trip that previously took one uh, one hour. We have 304 employees for the whole operation. 55% men, 45% women, which is a, 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 a very important number in terms of, of gender equity and reliability is, 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 is good and really high. It's being a project uh, uh, recognized as a, as a model project by the World Bank. Uh, I mean, the, the social management is, is, is a very uh, long topic that will take maybe hours to, to be explained, but uh, I just included a few a few slides. I will send you the copy of the of the presentation anyway. But what I would like to like to mention here is that Ciudad Noir was the, was a, 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 a an area in which nobody wanted to to be. Now Ciudad Noir is one of the centers of activity in the city. A lot of activities like the, in this case it was a, a downhill contest. Uh, took place in, in Ciudad Bolívar, organized by us. Uh, a lot of interaction with the community and the interaction started from the beginning of the construction. It's not something that has to be done only from the operation moment, but from the beginning of the, con of the, of the project, from the conception of the project, because once you get the community involved in the project, they will make the project, the project their own project and they will, be, they will be the best allies of the city. Uh, to keep the, the project running and in good shape for the next 30 years. Uh, it's also accessible. We have a differential approach. We work a lot on, 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 on people with disabilities to guarantee that they have a, a fully uh, a full, a, a, a quality service, 100% quality service. We do a lot of activities with, with the community. Uh, not just inside the cable, but around the cable to, to construct uh, using what we call micro actions collectivas, which is micro actions, uh, but working with the community to make it, to, to make the, the whole area grow and, and, and get the development of the whole, of, of the whole uh, zone. Uh, from the COVID side, which is also a, a topic uh, an issue these days, uh, it's worth mentioning here that we achieved a few months ago a certificate from, from the entity, a context entity that uh, is uh, 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 the technical uh, quality control, that I, mean, I mean, the one that gives the certifications of ISO uh, type of, of certification, ISO 9000, ISO 14, uh, and they certified that we got uh, biosecure operations for our passengers and for our employees. These pictures show a little bit of what we do here. And, and, and it's very, very interesting for us right now that uh, in the whole transportation city of Bogota, we are the only ones that right now have recovered 100% of the passengers of the pre-COVID uh, uh, stage. Everybody else is around 50%. We are right now, uh, we achieved last week, actually the, the 100%. Uh, well, that was all I tried to make the, the long story short. Uh, but if you have a question, comments, please don't hesitate to, to write me or, or, or tell me. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Victor. Thank you very much for that brilliant um, presentation. Um, uh, some of the questions also that I had you, you've answered Which, uh, one, of the the issues, one of the issues that, um, uh, that, that, that came to my mind was the issue of how you engage all stakeholders. I mean, that's the social management part of it because I mean, for us in Freetown here, quite a few people might be um, uh, taken out of business. You know, the people okay. riding the bikes, people riding the, the, the um, three wheelers and so on. Um, uh, they will have a part to play because some of them will be will be out of business and so on. How do you engage them? So that social management aspect was very, very important. Thank you very much for um, that presentation. I will now ask Mr. George Ramos Lopez, who is mechanical engineer of Medellin, Colombia, with 20 years 
of experience of implementing cable car and train systems in the city of Medellin. He is the cable car director at Metro de Medellin, responsible for the operation and the maintenance management of five AL cable car lines, Metro cables they call them in Medellin. Um, for those of us who um, have done some reading, we know Medellin is a city with steep hills, just like Freetown. So I can imagine the challenges are similar. Mr. Lopez will therefore share his experience of the massive transformation that has taken place as a result of the implementation of the cable car system in Medellin. Mr. Ramos Lopez, please do your presentation. Yes, hello, greetings to all, especially people from Freetown. We appreciate the invitation made to participate in this webinar to share some experience related to the process of planning, building and launching a cable car project. First of all, I want to show you the location of our city. and its metropolitan area, the largest city, two and a half million inhabitants in Medellin and 3.8 million inhabitants in metropolitan area. Uh, besides, Medellin is the core of the metropolitan area of Abora Valley. This is a conurbation uh, compound by nine municipalities uh, in the province of Antioquia. Our company, Metro de Medellin, was created in 1979 uh, to manage and operate the mass transport system in the city. Uh, it's 100% public, 50% by the local authority, and 50% by the province, Antioquia. Uh, we operate two metro lines, two heavy metro lines, uh, three BRT lines of uh, gas and electric buses, and of course, five uh, cableway lines, uh, our metro cables. One of them is under construction. Uh, we began operation in 1995. Uh, we have we been a pioneer in Colombia by operating the first metro, and of course, the first urban cable car integrate into a transport network. The origin of Metro Cable, Metro Cables, uh, the metropolitan area that you can see uh, in the pictures, uh, extend in a linear way by the Medellin River. The city's pattern of the ground is characterized by expansion of the slope of the narrow and deep valley especially in the low-income neighborhoods. The idea of Metro Cables began in the 90s, and the main objective was to improve the access of the residents of the upper neighborhoods to the main metro system. This way, uh, Medellin's Metro Cables have a special interest due to the way in which they combine the two dimensions. Innovation in the use of uh, transport for technology sectors of the city. In this picture, we can see how was the influence on uh, before first Metro Cable were built. Uh, we had a single clear street of 700 meters and the rest of the road is above the houses. In this picture, we can see the after. Uh, we can see the buildings, the library, uh, police station, bridges, of course, the station of the systems, habitational project, another bridge. What happened here? The once Metro Cable has been built, the city administration has developed the potential of the system as a reference point and more comprehensive urban intervention. Compared with uh, other urban transport system, Metro, Cable, Metro Cables 
can be built over a relatively short period of time and comparatively low cost as they require little in the way of land acquisition. The cost of Key Line, the first Metro Cable, was $24 million. And the second one, Line J, the cost was $47 million. From this perspective, uh, speed and cost are the primary concerns for a project, but other variables have a quite importance, such as energy consumption, uh, environment, and social equity. Besides being an excellent uh, mean of transportation and mobility solution, Metrocable has changed people's mind. It's impossible to deny the positive impact generated by the cable car system in aspect as uh, important and easy of transport, comfort, reduced traveling time, uh, environmental care, and infrastructure development. Through this respect, that is evident inside the cabins. Thanks to the metro cables, people who live in other parts of the city can now visit these communities and find out how we live up society. In this picture, we can see the integration of Metro Cables. The blue line is our Metro heavy line and the orange, the same, another Metro heavy lines. And we can see the integration. Ah, and this green line is a tramway. You can see the integration. We have our Metro Cables here, line J. Here, line M, integrate to tramway. Line H, integrate to tramway. Line K, our first line, integrate to metro line. Line L, this is a touristic line, integrate with another metro cable. And line P is under construction. We hope to start operation uh, next month. Here we can see picture of integration. In this picture, we can see Lang K, our first metro cable line. In the first floor, you can see the train, a metro, heavy metro line. You descend from the cabin, uh, walk some meters, go downstairs, and you can take the metro system. In this picture, the same. This is line B. This is our train. You descend from the cabin. You walk some steps and you can take the metro system to go to downtown. In this picture, one of our newest uh, metro cable, this is line H. You go descend from the cabin and can take the tramway. You can see in this picture, the our tram. Of course, the characteristic of uh, integration are these four, operational integration, uh, the same conditions, same hours to move uh, in the system. Uh, physical integration, you don't need to go out from the system, you all are always inside the system. Same for, you don't need to pay additional fee to use the Metro Cable. You go out from the train, take the metro cable and you don't need to pay uh, an additional fee. And mean of payment. We have a contact, contactless card, it's called Civica, and you can use it to uh, go into the system, metro, metro cable, train, tramway, BRT. In this table, we have uh, some technical characteristics um, of our metro cables. Lang K was opening in 2004. We have been operating this line for 16 years. Uh, length, the longest line is line L, touristic line. Uh, well, vertical rise, line A, 600 meters. Line J have 21 towers. 
capacity. Capacity is very important uh, characteristic in this system. We have two lines, line K and line J, with 3,000 people per hour and direction. And line K and line J have four stations, one of them uh, you can use it to uh, make the integration to the metro system. And number of cabins, line J is 119 cabins, line K uh, 1993 cabins. The other lines are smaller, 47, 42, 49, 49 cabins. Total mobilized passenger mediums, uh, line K have moved 200 million passengers, 205 million passengers. It's, it's a lot of people that we have moved in our line K. Line J is going to 100 million passengers. And in total, we have moved more than 300 million passengers in all our metro cables. During uh, 2019, Line K moved uh, 15 million passengers, a lot of people too. So this is a very uh, resume characteristic of our metro cables. Uh, thank you for giving us the possibility to share this experience. Uh, and we hope to see you in Medellin when we have overcome the COVID times. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Lopez, for that um, wonderful presentation and um, the sharing of your experience. I am particularly happy to hear the um, mention of integration because for me as a transportation person as well, you know, that's one of my concerns. You know, when you have a new system is how can that be integrated with your existing urban transportation system? So for us in Freetown here, that is something we need to look at, you know, to make sure that we have a proper um, a transport master plan for Freetown so that, so that a system like that can be um, very well integrated into that. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we have... We have, we have spent quite a lot of time. You know, I did say um, this will take about 90 minutes. I mean, we are, far, we, are, we are just about 90 minutes, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, uh, start with the Q&A. Let us see how much of these questions panelists can answer. Um, uh, the questions are in the, in the Q&A um, uh, platform. Um, we have quite a few which are similar questions. You know, you have um, you have questions like um, the issue of weather. You know, we have um, a challenge in weather conditions in Freetown. Um, heavy rain, heavy lightning, and so on and so forth, right? Um, uh, you know, some people are concerned about how you know, rains and heavy winds and, and lightning and all of those safety issues, you know, how reliable will um, uh, things like, um, you know, arrestors, lightning arrestors and other devices, how reliable will they be at such a, such a height? So those are like um, uh, some of the common questions. So I will now open the floor to the panelists. You know, the, uh, the questions are, I think the, 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 the nature of the questions are indicative of who they are addressed to. Um, the first one from Prince Commander is talking about um, uh, the data, and um, uh, you know he's talking about the reduction in in congestion of fifty percent. That is, I am sure it's um, uh, for Engineer Mudupe Williams. Over to you. Yes, thank you, um, Engineer Savage. Um, yes, the, the question relates to, to reducing congestion at a number of junctions in, in, in the central parts of, of the city of Freetown. Yes, the, the, the planned interventions don't only, do not only include the cable car. There are proposals for a number of those junctions to be improved, either through signalization of the junctions 
and uh, managing um, the pedestrian flow around the junction. So those, those interventions will happen before the cable car. And, and in some cases, the congestion will be significantly improved even before the cable car um, is implemented. So yes, um, the cable car um, is, in, is an improvement in terms of moving people more, more effectively and efficiently across the city. Uh, it's a model, model share from the, the existing um, fleet of public transport to a more efficient fleet. So it will also contribute towards the reduction but there, are, but there are already other plans in place to, to undertake junction improvement schemes at a number of these locations identified in the Transform Free Town program. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I, I can see there's quite a lot of other questions which um, are really within your, within your ballpark. Um, you know, there is another one here relating you know, to the issue of consideration of other, other, other sort of um, uh, um, 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 modes, light rail and tram, you know, can we consider those around the peninsula, right? Um, that's that's from, from one of your participants. I think that's from Ms. Commander. Yeah. The reason why the railway system was brought to us to halt all those years ago. Those of us who, who remember it when it ran in free time was because it was publicly operated and it didn't have enough demand to, um, to sustain the operation of the railway. So um, similarly, if you have a light rail system, which has a, a capacity that by far exceeds the, the demand in the city, then it will not be self-financing. So the, the, what we need to, the systems we need to consider, which I was trying to explain in, in my presentation was systems in which you can maximize um, the, the, um, the movement of people through that system, through, through, that, through that public transport system. The cable car is, as, as, as we estimate, as we, as we kind of see it, the, the, the numbers of passengers that can move is in line with the current travel demand. Um, so there might be a time when the city will move to the west, and then possibly if you can plan for, for growth, you can plan for a change in the center of the city, then you could probably build in um, a railway system or, or light rail system into your plans. But um, the cable car is looking at existing um, land use patterns and trying to, the cable car solution is being proposed to address existing land, land use patterns in Freetown and to address the medium to short term um, travel demands that coin exist in the city. Right, thank you very much. Um, there is a question about, about the, um, the issue of power, you know, our intermediate power supply here in Freetown, you know, what guarantees do we have about sustainable electricity for the system? Yeah. Um, yeah, we have discussed this with, with potential suppliers of cable car systems. I think typically all mass transit systems need to pass your, your safety case a case for safety, you need to be able to um, have built-in resilience into your system. You can't rely on a single mode of power supply. So um, a cable car system will need to have some resilience in power supply. So if you are forecasting that the grid, if we, if we were to rely on the grid, will be available for 60% of the time, then you need to provide capacity for the other 40% of the time. But, uh, and you also need to have a fail safe, safe system. So um, this is part of a, a, the feature of the design. You, you're not reliant on the grid 
to ensure the safety of your system. You will not be able to pass your safety case to bring the system into service if you are purely reliant on the grid. So the so the the, um, the operator of the cable car system will need to demonstrate that there's enough um, resilience in the system to to take into account any um, downtime in power supply through the, through the grid, if that was the means of power supply. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. I mean, as I mentioned, you know, after after I mean, I mean, Mr. Ramos, Ramos Lopez's presentation, another, another panelist has mentioned the same issue about the integral nature of the Columbia projects, you know, and they may, they are saying, how can we ensure that sort of um, integration and coordination is taken into account for our free town projects? Yeah. Uh, we, 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 in this, we are working with, with the city council is represented on the, um, the other planned projects for the city being led by the Ministry of Transport. And we share their plans. Uh, we share our plans with them, and they share their, uh, their plans with us. And as I illustrated in my, one of my slides, the proposals for the bus improvement corridor, um, we're looking to ensure that there is um, integration at key locations between the cable car stations and the bus improvement corridor. Okay. And um, Mr. Lopez, somebody is asking about the cost of, of maintaining such a large number of, of fleets, like the ones you presented. Maintenance costs. Yes. Roughly. Uh, we don't have the, the specific cost, but remember that we operate a metro system, BRT lines, tramway, and five metro cables. Uh, so uh, everything is in the same count. But of course, uh, you need a very important fund in order to respond to the rigorous maintenance that it requires uh, in this kind of cable cars. Okay. All right. All right. Because I mean, well, I guess again that will be um, that will be part of the, the the studies, you know, because definitely this will have to go through um, a detailed feasibility studies. Um, one other, one other, one other issue that um, uh, you know, one of our participants have raised is the issue about you know the lines. I mean, and this is again for you, Mudupe. That um, I think one of the routes that you mentioned is from National Stadium to Lomli. Um, so he's saying, looking at the fact that Congo Cross is also a central hub, have you considered giving this a consideration to making a station there as well? Or, or is this going to be part of um, additional feasibility studies for other lines? Yes, you can say that the, the, the stations are not yet set in stone, but okay. uh, the idea of the, of the cable car is to complement a bus service which would take the most short, shorter trips. So we have um, a direct route from Lomley into Brookfields. So if you are traveling from Lomley to Brookfields, you use the cable car, but if you're traveling from Wilkinson Road to Congo Cross, you use the bus. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then, um, uh, yeah, there's another one here asking about, you know, the um, how much sensitization have been done by the Freetown City Council on this? Because you know, in 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 um, uh, in Victor's presentation, one of the things that I loved about that is that um, uh, issue of stakeholder engagement to ensure ownership, to ensure that communities are engaged on such a project. You know, I mean, have we started to do any kind of sensitization by the city council? We have started, and we've got a lot more to do still. So this is very much at the initial stage. Um, we have engaged our, 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 our council representatives 
We have engaged stakeholders within the country um, in Sierra Leone, various MDAs. Um, we have discussed the proposals at um, government level, but we still have a lot more stakeholder engagement to do. This is only the start. And this event is again an, an opportunity for us to get uh, more of our stakeholders to, um, to um, better, to become more aware of some of the potential benefits of the cable car and to um, um, pose questions and for us to provide responses to their questions. So it's, as I said, this is very much a start and we've got a lot more to do in terms of stakeholder engagement. Right, okay. Because, um, some, because again, you know, a similar question to that is talking about what, how do you think the Okada riders will fare, you know, when you take about 6,000 of their trips away, you know, how you replace all of those. So those are very, very important things to consider during the, um, during the, the, the engagement process or, 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 or the integration process um, uh, to see how that can be integrated, even with their own mode of transport. And that is all the more reason why we should have a proper, you know, transport plan for. for maybe, maybe we should ask um, Captain Olimide to give the, the, the Lagos experience because I think they have, they have got a similar challenge in terms yeah. of. <clears throat> yeah. Captain. Well, in terms, sorry. You know, yes. sorry, I can't hear you because my, my link is very faint. What was the question? Yeah. The, the question, you know, it, there is a concern. You know, we have, we have the two wheelers. You know, the the bike. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And and some three wheelers. You know, the cable car. You know, from mm. what we have seen, will take a lot of passengers off of them. You know, over six thousand of their trips, right? So how how did you manage to bring them on board to engage them to make sure that they are part of the system to get that that ownership? Yes. Well, the thing is that. In Lagos, we had the advantage that, um, let me put my video on. We had the advantage in Lagos because the government of Lagos had banned the use of these um, tricycles okay. and okay. these motorcycles, the Okadas and the tricycles mm -hmm. within the central business district of Lagos. Mm -hmm. They were going to replace them with um, uh, buses, um, light buses, mm -hmm. you know, like 20 seater mm -hmm. buses. So it wasn't that we were taking anybody's job and so on. But what we did was we used the fare box uh, of a typical Okada uh, in terms of distance, how much they were charging. And we used that as our fare box for the cable car for a similar distance. However, there are very strong unions, transport unions in Nigeria. And what we had assured them was that we would not take any patronage from the existing BRT lines and passengers because the BRT lines and the light rail are government owned. And of course they're subsidized, but ours is a private initiative. It's a private sector driven project. So there are no subsidies. We're charging market, market fares. And which means the passengers would typically prefer to go in a cable car because in Lagos, and I'm sure the same exists in Freetown, you have what they call VOT and that's value of time. It's not, mm. a, it's not about the price of the ticket or the inconvenience. It's about how much time you're saving going from point A to point B. So I think the situation in Lagos alleviated itself because of the government banning these Orcadas yeah, and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. I, I, I remember now, I remember the days, I mean, you know, when I went to Liberia, there was a time when in fact they were confiscating bikes and they actually burned them I would guess where they were born in them. Yes. That was that was one of the ways they got rid of them from Lagos. Yeah. So and yeah. I would like to say before you go on, sorry, I'd just like to add that the cable car is fully multimodal with the yeah. other forms of government transport. Every station of the cable car fully integrates with another form of transport, for example. Yeah. Yeah. But every one of our stations is fully multimodal and not independent, but they're all dependent. Yeah. I, I would like to add to that. Um, when we That's very important. Car in, 
yeah. I would like to add to that when we built the cable car in La Paz, Bolivia, we were asked to build multimodal stations and we were given a maximum interchange time of four minutes. So we had to ensure that every passenger can change from the cable car to another mode of transport within four minutes. That meant we had to build um, bus stops and taxi wings just really close to the station. So it was part, all part of an integrated package in La Paz. And, and, and may I ask, was that using a, 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 the same single fare system or they had to... Not yet. They're working on that because uh, it's a national, there's a national uh, BRT system or bus premium bus okay. service. Okay. The cable car service. But they're working on that. Okay. Okay. So these are these are some of the lessons that we we should we should learn. So thank you very much. Um, uh, yeah. There are, there are quite a few other questions. We are we are roughly approaching. Um, you know, about two hours now. You know, we we wanted to take this for one hour 30 minutes um, so i think most of the other questions that we have in the q a session i will ask um, our panelists to look at them and um, uh, and answer those questions you know by email to those participants who have asked those questions and um, the email link you know that they should send those questions to are indicated in the in the webinar chat you know, so if they put those questions on those chats and send them to the email, those questions will be answered directly to you. Um, so at this point in time, I think um, uh, we should um, uh, thank everybody for your Can I, Sorry. Yeah. I, I, oh, I was just going to say, I think the mayor wants to say something. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Yes, okay. I mean, I I actually had yeah, Sasha. Go, go ahead, go ahead, ma'am. Well, let me, I was wanting to, to speak to a particular question which has come up a number of times, which is one about um, the jobs. Um, and yes. just to say that um, Transform Freetown does take an integrated approach. And in other sectors, um, from the tourism work we're doing to, to the green economy, sanitation, these are all you know, areas where we've got an objective of creating additional jobs. Um, so, from the perspective of cattle riders, um, the, the, the whole you increase productivity, economic productivity, when you reduce travel time from two hours to 20 minutes. Um, and that in itself um, stimulates the economy and create, allows there to be the creation of more jobs. What we want are good jobs, um, as opposed to you know, uh, um, um, any job. So, so to those who've been concerned about jobs, just to say it's not a simple answer by any means, but it's part of our approach in doing this. And, and may I also just use this opportunity to thank the Sierra Leone Institute, Institution of Engineers, um, the president, um, Engineer Trudy Morgan, uh, and yourself, obviously our chair tonight, Engineer Badamassi, but Louise and Henry and everybody at the institution for um, giving Free City Council and, and our colleague cities this platform to share experiences and plans and um, to the point about sensitization as Dupe has said this is part of the process there will be more um, but we do believe that the benefits outweigh the the, the challenges um, and we're looking forward to Fritonians all joining hands with us um, to make this happen in our journey to transform Freetown thank you thank you very much Joe. Lord Chief thank you very much for that um, I want to join the mayor also to thank you all for your patience. And um, uh, we hope that this has created a platform um, uh, for discussion for our stake for our policymakers to consider because we have seen um, uh, clearly the advantages of this system. Of course, there are challenges which um, uh, are not insurmountable. We can address those challenges from the experiences that we have received from our international panelists. I want to take this opportunity to thank um, uh, our panelists, Captain Dapo, um, uh, Mr. George, Lopez, Ramos, and also Captain Ominde, and um, uh, Victor Cordoba. And not forgetting, of course, our key presenter, Engineer Mudupe Williams. For that brilliant presentation. I thank you all very much and I thank panelists for attending.
and then may as i said the presentations will be sent to you for those of you who will request for the presentations and i think the recordings are also available for those who um, wish to get those recordings so i want to thank you all once again and wish you all a very good evening thank you very much Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you very much. Bye-bye. 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 B